the content that's available from this league that runs 10 weeks so it's 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 that sprint you can really put a lot into those 10 weeks or 10 games they probably have a bye week in there or something and oh, yeah you yeah. you're right and there's no you're not even going to inter- go out and interview a coach yeah, yeah you got to be hard, like doing hard knocks Welcome to the 11th Island. I'm Brad here with Chris. If you are fans of the show, you know we love our CFL. And if you're big fans of the show, you know the USFL content's coming up soon. We're in the off season for both. We decided to mash them all up together in an alt football show. So, Chris, what are we starting with? We're starting with, oh, what is going on with the USFL? It's April that this stuff is supposed to be coming out. Brad, what do we have in terms of news and updates? So recently, there was the four head coaches of an eight-team league have been announced, and the director of player personnel and Jim Pop. Chris, you want to go through some of the coaches here? Yes, yes. So we got we got Tom Haley, Kevin Sumlin, Mike Riley, and Bart Andrus. Brad, what what's kind of interesting about these guys? Well, like I don't want to get into too much detail because it, it is a little bit old news. But the one thing I would say about each guy is that they're offensive minded, and when you're a alt football league you need to be off you need offense to bring it in defense is not really going to sell tickets when people can go watch college football or the nfl so they're all offensive minded they all have a history i think when we last talked about the usfl we said that the most important hires are going to be their coaches and their qbs uh i don't think your coaches none of these guys are necessarily eye-popping names but you you were never going to get that for this league you could maybe hope to poach one big name but Todd Haley's probably the biggest name out of this. But I think with what they were, what their options were, they probably got a good selection here. My concerns are, you've hired four of eight coaches. Are you waiting? What's the wait to, mm-hmm. to announce the other four? And at this point, with how they're delaying it, it seems to me that they might not have the other four hired yet. Do you agree? I see. Because my, my thing is like Bart Andrus. I'm pretty sure was did something with the spring league from mm. like last year mm. like was involved in some capacity so i'm wondering if the rest of these guys have already been sorted but it's it's gonna be uh just guys that have been already involved with the spring league in the past and maybe not as big names as these guys and they're just gonna wait and then one friday night they're gonna say yeah yeah we hired these guys yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think if that's their plan, it's pretty poor marketing. I think if they had them, they might as well have just released all the coaches at once. Because the longer you delay it, the more that people are going to, uh, like this, make assumptions that you haven't even hired a head coach yet. Or if, if you're going to put out a press release, you want to put the top names at the top of the billing. And then if there's kind of lesser names, you want to bury them at the bottom. You know what I mean? You don't mm. want to kind of prom- promote that you're hiring people that nobody knows. So, I, yeah, that's I, my I point. Just, so they're, they're just gonna wait till a Friday and just Friday night. Everybody's distracted, out how out on the town having a good time, and they're just gonna put out a press release about. Oh during, yeah, yeah, we doing like the conference championship. Yeah, or something yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. They could just there. yeah, they could just on the su- day of the Super Bowl just say yeah, yeah, okay, we're, we're out. <laughs> you know. It is the USFL is in a very strange spot because they they have a lot of things coming up. Like the this the league starts April sixteenth, game start, training camp start middle of March, the mm-hmm. the draft starts end of February, and there's not a lot that we know about this league other than they're finally cleared to play in Birmingham all of their games, and we have five key personnel listed for an mm-hmm. eight team league. Mm-hmm. The other the other key personnel that we didn't mention is Jim Pop, a form mm-hmm. a CFL legend in in all respects, who's going to be their director of player personnel. Mm-hmm. I mean, most casual fans probably don't even understand what a director of player personnel really does. So mm-hmm. I don't think that's groundbreaking news. The USFL needs to. I understand that the NFL is dominating right now, but this is when you start planting seeds while people yeah. are still thinking about football. From February to April. People are going to start forgetting about football after the Super Bowl. You mm-hmm. want to plant the seeds now so they start looking forward to April. Yeah, you got to get that director of PP out. And uh, <laughs> not as not as exciting for the kids, I guess. Um, yeah. All this stuff. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that ultimately one thing that they're doing right is I think I've sworn I've seen a couple ads during NFL games. I think that's one thing that's really big that I never really remember the XFL doing when it first came out. And that might be different because we're in Canada and we get the Canadian ads. It's it's totally a different advertising think, landscape. But I mean, no, I think you're right because Fox has the deal and Fox. Oh, I, that's has so they get cheap slots the then. Yeah. So so how they use that, I mean, and, and I'm pretty sure like Fox will have the Super Bowl. No. Or just see, does We're in it, is it, I'm gonna watch Super Bowl CNBC. On yeah, yeah it's, it, it's CNBC. I'm trying to think of who who gets the. But anyways, you're gonna get some big games too. It, it depends on how Fox is gonna use the slot, the slots, the ad slots, and that's. I mean, it, that's what it comes down to. And and I think that's what Fox is really uh, banking on is is the fact that hey, we know television. We're going to have this on our station, which is already frequently visited, but we're just going to pump. And I, and I think the way the, like you really can't for something like this, get the, grab the casual fans attention and say, like, get ready for this. This is coming because that person's going to be saying, okay, I just want to focus on NFL right now. I, like, I watch maybe one game a week. I'm going to go in, watch my NFL, leave. It's it's got to be an impulse for, for to get most fans in the door. It's got to be a you know what I'm really not doing anything right now. Let me watch this uh, football in April. I think that's really where they're what they're gonna bank on, and because they have that TV element, they can just lean right into that right when it's hot. Yeah, you're guaranteed a certain number just from being on Fox. I I agree with you. I think that's gonna be the majority of the fans here. I think that right now, though, the USFL, if you were to poll casual viewers of football, a lot of them might not even know that the USFL is a thing or coming back at all. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that they can work on. But I do I do agree with you. I, I think that trying to get people excited to a level of us is unrealistic. Yeah. But and you're going to have to. Yeah, and I think it comes around. You got to get the casuals in just just because they're not doing anything. And the timeline does seem off a hundred percent for okay, we we running out of time here and we haven't heard much, but I think one of the elements is one, the league's branding in terms of teams, uh everything has been already kind of created back in the nineteen eighties, and then also the bones of this league, which will run out of one stadium in Birmingham, is mm -hmm. has already been established in the spring league. So they're really just taking two uh, things that have already existed and putting them uh, that exist right now and put them together, and that that's what's going to form this, I guess, more official league. Really, really, what they're doing is putting cameras on the spring league at the end of the day. But they add that I, branding, I agree, I agree. and I agree with what you're saying. Like they're taking bones of two different things, jam them together. Yeah, but those two things were also failures. So we we have to also tell people. <laughs> why it's going to be different this time and then yeah. i and even if you're not going to go big market ads i follow the usfl on all social media accounts they're largely inactive on most of these their ads don't even really have usfl marketing it, it very much looks like stock stock little bit football videos that would be extreme like we could make the videos that they're doing in all honesty well, they need to they need to bring in like there's no reason why these four head coaches that were announced can't be interviewed and clips put out on social media channels on the USFL channels. And that's not taking extra that much extra money. Well, You're have we reached out them. to any of these guys? Have we? we yeah. Wow. Well, we got to reach out to these guys before we say, oh, they're not they're not getting interviewed. Could be well, an I mean, the USFL's, but yeah, okay. There's a difference between us reaching out and the USFL being like, "We're your boss. Sit yeah. down. We got a few questions for you, and there's gonna be a camera here." Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd think. You, I thought in my my head when you had Fox doing this, you had it all in one air, spot. 
you had, I, I, which means that players are going to have to move there and live with each other. There's going to be some sort of like dorm setup here. Yeah. You, your mind immediately goes to reality TV. If you're, if we're talking about Fox, you know, there's just the content that's available from this league that runs 10 weeks. So it's, it's, it's that sprint. You can really put a lot into those 10 weeks or 10 games. They probably have a bye week in there or something. And oh, yeah, you yeah. you're right. And there's no, you're not even gonna inter go out and interview a coach. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be hard, like doing hard knocks, like mm -hmm. aggressively. You gotta you gotta really sell to people that there's been a lot of failed spring leagues. This one isn't gonna fail, and you should watch it. And here's why. And so far, there's been a, so far as as a show that plans on doing a weekly USFL show. I've been struggling to get excited for this because of the lack of news. So I can't imagine somebody that doesn't is a casual football fan, doesn't even really know much about the USFL, sure as hell isn't going to know any of these coaches' names. Chris is walking off screen. Oh, no, we're just taking a sweater off, giving the people a show here. Oh, he's got the USFL shirt on. Right. I'm excited. That's why, okay. that's why we I'm were 15 excited. minutes late to record because Chris was trying to find the USFL shirt. It's been buried since. No, nah, I slept in it. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> bottom line, the USFL can do a better job. Honestly, Chris, you bring up a good idea. I think we should reach out to these coaches, see if we can get an interview. I highly doubt any of these guys come on. But well, I mean, we could, tell, we could tell Bart we're, we're big Argos fans. Yes. We could. Yeah, and speaking big. of mm -hmm. the Argos, they play in a league called the CFL. And mm -hmm. in that league, they're not in the Western Division, but then there's a Western Division. And let's talk about the quarterbacks there. How about it? How about that transition? All right. So we'll just go over the QB situation for essentially each team in the league. We'll start in the West. Start as far west as we can go. The BC Lions, Chris. Michael Riley. Is he going to retire? Is he not? That's kind of the situation that BC's waiting for. Mm -hmm. He's under contract for next year. People, Some people think he might walk away. Dealt with injury problems last year. It was clearly not the Michael Riley that we've learned to grow and love. Learn to grow and love? Well, a lot of people in the CFL, I'm not saying us, talking general for the CFL, but do you think he retires? And if he does... Is Nathan Rourke the QB, or do they hunt free agency? Uh, well, I th I think two things. One, what I saw from Michael Riley this season was that yes, mm -hmm. he is very injured, very very injured, but he's also very hardy. Like the guy, the guy is one of those. He'll just knock down, get right back up. Mm -hmm. I think if he wants to play. The ability to get through a season, kind of stumble through a season, but still pull out some spectacular games is there. I think he he's, for where uh, BC is right now, I think he can be that guy. It's just whether he wants to put up all that hurt on the body to probably not go very deep in the playoffs next season. I yeah, think or, that's... Yeah, I I would the way BC's roster, unless they do some big things, or to, agency, I wouldn't pick them to make the playoffs. Yeah, to make the playoffs, even so, I didn't want to be that harsh. Okay, I didn't want to, but you came on and said it, so I'm happy. We're I'm I'm good cop, you're bad cop, but anyways, but and then also Nathan Rourke, on the other hand, as well, uh, mm -hmm. this is a guy that a lot of people get very excited about because of the fact that he's a Canadian quarterback. And you saw them dangling out that shiny object all, all at the start of last season. All the time, they would kind of say, oh, Nathan Rourke is going to start. And then TSN is going nuts. Everybody's just getting excited. The fans chanting, like, let's go, Canadian QB. And then Michael Riley comes out. So <laughs> it's, I think, like, it'd be very exciting if the BC Lions are going to be in a position where it's like, hey, we're not going to do anything. We're not expecting to do anything spectacular. This might be a rebuild. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe platoon, even platoon, Nathan Rourke was somebody else that you can pick up at a discount. I think that's probably what's going to end up happening. I agree. 
And moving on to, we'll go to Calgary, I guess, Calgary mm-hmm. St. Peter's. Bo Levi Mitchell redid his deal, uh, took some guaranteed money off, gave it to Jake Meyer, who shockingly re-signed with them. So going into the new year, we a lot of people thought Jake Meyer would leave him free agency, go take a starting spot. And they're gonna. He's gonna be back. So presumably, Bo Levi's still the starter. Jake Meyer is gonna be the backup. They're both making pretty solid money. Both, I believe, on one-year contracts now. So it's kind of an awkward situation there. You got to think, eh? Well, I mean, if you if, if this was if these contracts were longer than one year, it'd kind of be okay. What are we doing here? And you have a situation. Like Hamilton last season was just quarterback battle and it's constant question. But if you if you're gonna look at it and say, okay, this is one year, and you look at Jake Meyer as the guy that's kind of the 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 upstart who's you know still probably at that discount for how good he is versus Bo Levi, who a lot of people are gonna say is kind of his value is inflated a little bit beyond what it should be, you know, just because of his start. I mean, you have guys on both sides of that spectrum. And you're going to say, hey, we're going to sign you both. Last season at work, we needed you both. That That's the thing. The Stampeders needed them both last season to do what they did. It's not like one of them sit, sat on the bench the whole time. One of them was injured the whole time. It was back and forth. They needed both of these guys. And they might be saying, you know what? Like, that worked. Let's just pay a little bit more, have the same scenario. scenario. But it's also that one-year playoff, I think. this is This is the last time... Bo Levi, I think Bo Levi really needs to kind of prove himself. There's a lot of pressure on Bo Levi here for Jake Meyer to to say, look, I could go and, and be the guy somewhere else and say, I'm going to be the backup. He's going to be coming hot on his trail anytime Bo Levi comes out of the game for any reason. And make no mistake, these both these guys are competing for this job. Yeah, I agree. I think it was a situation going in the off season. Calgary says to Bo Levi, "This is you've earned the opportunity to keep your job. Let this still be your team, and we're going to put a lot of faith that last year your early season injury really played into the rest of the year. So <clears throat> we're going to get let you be QB. You got a short leash. Jake Myers going to be behind you. He's probably our our future QB. So you really got one year left here to really prove yourself." Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's going to be it. And it wouldn't shock me if by midseason we got Jake Meyer. Also wouldn't shock me if by midseason Bo Levi is putting on an MLP, MLP type performance because he's that type of guy that's going to step up when the pressure's on. And in the CFL, there's a lot of value in having two great quarterbacks on mm-hmm. your team, considering I think there was two teams that went through the full year without a QB getting injured. So like you, you that second QB is... It's going to pay dividends probably for Calgary as well. Yep. Yeah, for sure. All right. Move on to Edmonton here. Yep. So Edmonton re up Nick Arbuckle. The prior GM traded for him, current GM, and uh, an organization. They gave him some guaranteed money to bring him in next year. We still have Taylor Cornelius on a very team friendly deal. The question is now new coach Chris Jones, does he want to bring in more assets to try and right the ship after a terrible year last year? Yeah, I it's it's hard to say. I, I think I think Nick Arbuckle is is a solid guy for that situation just because he's very he's very scrappy. You know, mm-hmm. he he's a very like we're gonna take this one play at a time kind of of a player, which I think the Elks kind of need to go into next season with a, with sort of a cautious optimism, as our mm-hmm. politicians keep saying these days, mm-hmm. uh, about what they're going to be able to accomplish, what they're what they're trying to accomplish and pull off. And I think Taylor Cornelius. I mean, I've said some some things to him from the stands that I'm not totally proud of, but. At the same time, he he's now got a lot of experience. Um, so I think probably improved over last season, if you look at it, if you look at everything. And, you know, I think he's going to be a reasonable backup, which is something that you might need with our book. Because, I mean, last season, definitely, we just didn't see him play a full season. The Argos kept 
bouncing him back and forth. And then, of course, he didn't finish off the season. They just kind of took him and then left him, Arbuckle. Yeah. And I think part of that was to preserve mm -hmm. his confidence. That's the that's the one thing. Um, while Arbuckle has been with the team and able to learn the playbook and everything, he's kind of separated from and, and he's been above some of the woes of last season where I, I think a lot of Elks players are going to have to get over the sour taste in their mouth from the way just the management work, which is gone now, but still that's going to linger on just the way those losses felt the frustration. Nick Arbuckle can come in and say, you know what? Yes, I have that synergy. I have that knowledge of the playbook that started a lot earlier than if I were to just be signed halfway through the off season. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I wasn't really involved with all the hurt from last year. Yeah, it's, Nick Arbuckle's getting major deja vu right now. He's going to a team that was terrible in the prior year. Uh, he was traded to them. They, Taylor Cornelius really is at this point, like probably a poor man's McLeod Bethel Thompson. So he's got the safe QB behind him. He's Nick Arbuckle, I've, I said all last year, I think he's got a high ceiling, he's got a low floor. And so... He's going to be going in. He's going to have to earn that job. I think Nick Arbuckle truly can be a starting QB in this league. If you've watched him play, there's just a, a semblance of, I don't know, it could be wrong, there's a semblance of confidence that I had. Remind you, one QB last year beat Winnipeg in not garbage time late regular season games. That was Nick Arbuckle. So he's got the, the potential is there. I think with Edmonton, with Chris Jones, I think he can spin Nick Arbuckle into shape. And I think, I think they got to give him the shot. I don't think you go out and free agency and make a run at Trevor Harris or Jeremiah Masoli. I think, I think you ride with Arbuckle, knowing that you have a safe option in Cornelius behind you. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. now, all right. Well, oh, moving on to Saskatchewan. yeah, we got to fly through this. I'm realizing like we haven't talked about this stuff in forever, and it's just like, well, we we got like three more teams in the in the West. Two Do more we? teams in the wild. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah. Um, my good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah. still have. <laughs> yes. My yes. goodness. Oh, boy. Right. Okay. So Saskatchewan. <laughs> Saskatchewan, we can get through pretty quickly. It's Cody Fajardo is your starting QB. He's under contract for next year. There is absolutely no reason for anything to change there. I think, like, the, you, you had another disappointing end to the season. You're not going to find a better QB than Cody Fajardo, Fajardo, Fajardo. <laughs> on the open market. Be happy that you have probably a top three QB in the league. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of issues there. I mean, he's he's a fast guy. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say he's a passer. It's more like a, a running back that takes snaps. I highly disagree <laughs> with that. I highly... <laughs> Fajardo, I th Fajardo truly is, I think, one of the better QBs in this league. I think mm -hmm. he was somebody that really struggled with the, the year off and the chemistry. I mm -hmm. think give him in 2022, I think he he'll be a lot better QB. I think Saskatchewan, I mean, you, you made it to the conference finals twice in a row. BC would love to be in that position. I get that it's heartbreak city against Winnipeg, but retool, come back, yeah. put your faith in Fajardo. And then, speaking about the team they lost to, Winnipeg. Big kind of story here. When, their quarterback, MLP last year, Zach Claros, is a free agent. Is he coming back? And then, what does Winnipeg do if he doesn't? Yeah. Nah, um, the, thing, the, the thing is, there's, a, like, there's really not a lot of places left for people to go for me to su to suggest to me that Zach Claros is going to be like, I'm leaving Winnipeg, you know? And I, and I think the, the one thing that yes, he's an MLP. Yes. He, he helped his team win the great cup, but I wonder if the only reason it's taken so long, when you look at a ton of other guys in Winnipeg starting to just go, let's do three, let's do three. Like that's what it's all about. And you see him kind of staying out of that conversation. Is he holding out for money that Winnipeg is just not going to give him? I don't know. I don't know. I think Zach Claros, like he doesn't have a, a major media presence. So 
I have to wonder if a lot of his perceived like quiet is just uh, his personality. Like he's here. just screaming at his phone right now, and it's just like <laughs> this. You don't have Twitter installed, bro. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's a situation. I think he's got to be expecting a bag here, but I don't see a situation where Winnipeg doesn't give it to him. And I think Zach Laros has got to understand that you've won two Grey Cups in Winnipeg. But if you go to the Ottawa Red Blacks and they put all their faith in you to be the new starting QB, yeah. you're not turning that. For, you're, he's yeah. not somebody that's going to turn around your franchise. But if you put all the right pieces around him, he can guide them to the Great Cup. Like, right? yeah, it, he's it, he's it, he's not going to crash your car. He's not going to turn into a Ferrari either. So, you know, that's. Yeah. I think the best place. I think you got to if you're Kolaris, you got to understand that. You're in no better situation than Winnipeg to try and run it back for a third straight year. I think that's what you, you just got to make it sit down, make it work with Winnipeg. They got a lot of free agents. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be going to sit at the table, be patient, make it work. Don't get greedy in the off season and like just try for three. Yeah. All right. Let's let's move on. All right. See now we're on the east side. East. We the east side where things get kind of a little bit interesting. There's a little yes, bit things. more of a carousel here. Yes. Yeah, so There's a can start, it's musical chairs, if you will. Yeah, we can start in Hamilton, where Dane Evans has re-signed with Hamilton on a multi-year deal, which essentially what we kind of expected. Dane Evans talked about testing free agency, didn't even get to February eighth. Re-signing with Hamilton. Jeremiah Masoli at this point is officially going to be let go. So Hamilton's Dane Evans' team. There's nothing I would say more saying that. I think, though, Chris, they made the right decision. What do you think? Um. Yes, I, I, I think Dave and you look at that back and forth that the Ticats QB situation had last year. I guess Dane Evans was the prevailing guy. I think more often than not, when Mazzoli was even in, People were saying, when is then eight? The, the conversation was usually, hey, when is Dane Evans going mm -hmm. to come in? You know, when are they, at what point do they put Dane Evans in uh, up until the very end when they finally did and things started working? Um, I think that this is always like the, the sentiment, even as close as those two guys to compare have always been in terms of the fans' mind, in terms of management's mind, like Dane Evans has always kind of been the shinier object um as the season got underway i think i think he had the first win of the season that plays a role in it you know mm -hmm. i think once you just get that in your brain like dane evans is the guy once after after the start to the season hamilton had last year with mazzoli and how disappointing that was all dane evans needed to do was come and get a win and i think just he's always going to be the guy now and if you're comparing the two uh, and so it, it makes sense if to he, me. If he didn't, get, if he Dane Evans doesn't get hurt yeah. after Masoli gets benched the first time, he, he, he Masoli's never seen the field again. Yeah. So so I th I think that uh, he's the guy. Wasn't surprised with that. And now Masoli's kind of interesting. Brad, where do you see him like ending up? I I think he's going to be one of the. That's tough. It it really is tough. I could see Edmonton taking a flyer. Like I said before, I, I would mm -hmm. disagree with that. I could see, for me, a team that we're going to talk about soon, the, the Ottawa Red Blacks. I, I hammered all last year. I think Trevor Harris is going there. I think it's going to be Trevor Harris or Jeremiah Masoli mm -hmm. going to Ottawa. I think that they're going to really have an option between those two. Mm -hmm. I, there's not really other fits in the league for them. I, some people say Toronto. So we can kind of parlay into Toronto here. You got McLeod Bethel Thompson's a free agent. Uh, you really don't have any other QBs on your roster. And Antonio Pipkins, I believe, is a free agent too. Mm. So some people think Toronto should take a, a shot at Masoli. That would just inflame the Hamilton rivalry. Yeah, see, that that storyline is mm -hmm. so appealing to me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and and whether as a, as if I as an Argos fan, I want Mazzoli on the team from practical from a team level i don't know but the 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 storyline you get both of these guys like the qb battle qb battle qb battle now these guys ba basically go like dan evans wins the spot and mazzoli goes to the team rival to kind of get his revenge you know 
that mm-hmm. that's just going to be so much content next season. That's going to be so good. And and in a, in a season where um, they're going to expand, like it's it's a normal season. We're going to have a full length, proper division rivalry. We're going to have full in the stands. Uh, the Thai Cats fans are going to try to black things. It's going to be so exciting if Mazzoli goes to Toronto. Yeah, I think so. I think if Toronto, I I would rather them go <clears throat> back with McLeod Bethel Thompson. I have mm-hmm. to wonder if, if that ship sailed because of the kind of McLeod Bethel Thompson not really had an easy road in Toronto. There's been a lot of disrespect thrown his way. There's been a lot of times. I mean, they benched him to start the year with Arbuckle. Yeah, I. I I, I could see them being forced to go with Miss Ole because if they even want to go with Macbeth, I think he might be going to greener pastures. And I can yeah. see Macbeth being a type of guy that we're going to see in the USFL soon enough, too. Well, well, speaking of Macbeth, you know, seeing Macbeth, I mean, you were in the parking lot after the East Finals mm-hmm. and you saw him. He walked by your car. I mean, did that look like a guy that was going to say, I'm coming back to Toronto? Yeah, he was he was limping out of there in a hurry. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's and enough then, said. And then the next team, the Ottawa Red Blacks, one of the worst teams last year, went through a carousel of QBs. What are they doing going into this year? We can assume Matt Nichols, <clears throat> I believe, is a free agent, probably retiring. He's injury woes. It, I, I can't see him finding a spot at best backup. We have Duck Hodges, who's re-signed for next year. He didn't show up very good last year. Caleb Evans coming back, had some promise, didn't really turn out as it, he kind of came on strong, flamed out very quickly. He, I mean, he, he's got tricks up his sleeve, and I think people mm-hmm. figured out the tricks. It's and and whether I think I think with Caleb Evans, if he can um, figure out in the off season, he can put in the work and figure out just a little bit of a longer side of his game. The longer side of his game, like uh, throwing downfield, um, I think he becomes dangerous. I think I think there's nothing because I mean his short game, his speed is going to be a huge asset. I mean he loves to just flip the ball around. The problem is you have nothing to counter that, so you know that's coming. There's nothing to counterbalance, and I think if he gets you know half decent at the other aspects of the game, he becomes dangerous again. Um, so I don't. I think you 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 can't count out Caleb, Caleb Evans, but there's a lot of work that needs to go in. Yeah, uh, Ottawa needs to build a better roster around their QB because no matter who they bring in at this point, they're not going to have You're, success. But they yeah. they're able to fill those pieces. I think they should take a stab at a veteran QB like a Masoli or a Trevor Harris. I think probably Trevor Harris, given the history that he has in Ottawa to this point, bring a little bit of fanfare to that. And I think you pick one of Caleb Evans or Doc Hodges presumably Caleb Evans, and those two, you put the veteran in to start the year knowing that there's a a young guy on a short leash that he can come in and is going to learn from the veteran QB and and be kind of the QB in waiting, which Mm -hmm. would really fit Caleb Evans for kind of his age. I think that's the best case. You bring in the veteran QB, it's going to sell tickets. It's going to bring a calming presence to a team that just had a terrible year, and then it, it allows... Like Caleb Evans to really learn how to be a CFL QB. So there was so, a lot of kind so, of deer in the headlight looks last man, year. Man, things are really bad. So let's just do what we did last year. Yeah, but you, like I said, <laughs> first you got to you, you got to put the roster in. Matt yeah, Nichols, yeah, like he was coming off a season where he was MLP type in Winnipeg. Was taking him to the they went made it to the Grey Cup. He it's not like they weren't going to do that if he was still their QB before he got injured. And then you just see what happens when you put a, a terrible roster around him, right? It's the mm-hmm. same thing with Zach Claros. I mean, he yeah. took Winnipeg to the Grey Cup. You think he was doing anything in Ottawa? They'd be in the same position. You mm-hmm. can only do so much. Mm-hmm. And then moving on to Montreal here, re-signed Vernon Adams Jr., let go of Trevor Harris, this is a move that we expected. I was a little worried. I was concerned that I didn't think Montreal was going to do this. I thought that they were going to hesitate a little bit. It's the right decision. Bring back Vernon Adams Jr. It's his team. Do you agree with me here, Chris? Yeah, and I, I think one of the benefits that the Alouettes have in general is, I mean, that offense is so much built around Vernon Adams. Vernon Adams Jr., with all those that wide receiver core that's so good, 
Vernon Adams is the glue that ties it all together. And I think it was very much loose at the end of the season. It was all, it was a, it was a loose collection of parts, you know, by the end of the season without him. And I think for the Alouettes who had kind of a season where they were perpetually in it and out of it at the same time, kind of that dark horse in the division as the Ticats and the Argonauts really battled for first place. And then to really kind of get stuffed by the Ticats in the first round of playoffs, you, you're you able to say, you know what, there's a reason, an external reason why we why last season was the way it was, and it's because Vernon Adams wasn't there. And you can kind of throw Harris under the bus, and you can say, oh, it's because of Vernon Adams is here this year. And I think it, that leads to a positive outlook going into it. That's a good way to start a new season where you can kind of look at the past and say, okay, this is where it went wrong, but also it wasn't our fault. And now the reason why it didn't work out is back, and then we're good. You know, I that think might that's... Be, yeah. That might be a little bit of revisional history there, but I, I get that you can do that. Yeah, I, you, I, I you know, like, I, I, yeah, it's like you're going to always revise, you know, it's really, it's not how, how it was, it's how you feel about it. That's really, <laughs> I, that's the real history there. And, and going into that playoff game against Hamilton, I would have felt a lot more confident in Montreal if Vernon Adams there. He's just such a dynamic QB. And that chemistry that, that he has, him and Geno Lewis, who I think is the best wide receiver in the league. I'm sorry, Brian Burnham. But I they have great chemistry together. They make magic happen. I, I, think, I think this was the right move. And Montreal is another team that they need to build around. They need to build out a better roster. I think that they thought that Toronto might not have been as good last year and that they had a real shot at first. They were perpetually in the playoffs simply because Ottawa is who they are. I think now they know that the division is going to be a little tougher at the top and that they uh, need to build out a little better. Yeah. Now, Brad, we have a decision to make because you start work in like eight minutes. It's fine. Just keep going. Just keep going? Because, I mean, this is also, we're like 40 minutes in. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, we're, we might as well just keep rolling. Okay, it. so this is a long one today. Uh, how should the USFL handle its draft, Brad? That's what we're wondering. That's what the people are wondering, the people that did not ask. We're going to tell them. <laughs> so, in February 22nd and 23rd, they have the league selection team meetings. That's what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. If I'm the USFL, again, this goes back to the first topic that we... Marketing. Just, we need better marketing. I'm saying... You know what, man? When you do a fantasy draft, mm -hmm. all the players just become available on the draft board. I think you gotta you gotta put the player selections, all the available players. You gotta release them early February. We need, and then it's just a full blown fantasy draft. We need mm -hmm. mock drafts. We need people predicting who's gonna pick, and then we want each coach or GM for each team coming up to. It's not gonna be a podium. They're not renting out a hall for this. I'm U.S. Phil does not have the money to do that, but. Do it on Zoom. There's a bug going around. We can't be in person anyway. <laughs> we'll do it on Zoom. Make the selections like that. It's intriguing. Get you a TV spot. Gets people to tune in. You can interview the players as they're picked. It's something else. Don't do what the XFL did, where they essentially just said, we're going to place a QB on each team. So there's no intrigue for that. And then we're essentially just going to release our selections. And we did it by position group. I want to... I want in round two, but the, the and, wide and, and receiver still, pick and then a defensive tackle. And they did that, I and still be, the teams were all rigged and, and not balanced at all. <laughs> yeah, I think in, in this, you're going to see, like when you're looking at teams, again, this is also, for people like us, we've already picked our team, but a lot of people are going to be need to pick a team. You watch the draft, you see a guy pick three offensive players to start the draft. You go, this team's going to be offensive-minded. Or you see him pick a couple defensive players to start it. I might like this defensive-minded team. It's it's intrigue, different, something that's going to get people into it. Do I think they will actually do this? Absolutely not. I think they're going to do what the XFL did and essentially release a press statement and say this is who we picked and who we placed on each team. And I think that is a terrible idea. Do you agree with me? Um, one thing that I will say and this is not meant to insult anybody, demean anybody, make anyone feel bad. But if you would look at the, the ratings for something like the NFL draft, 
that is way up there. Like this is a this is a major event, especially during the COVID when there was no football on. This was a major sports event. If you remember two two drafts ago when it was the only sports event we had in forever, and Goodell was in his basement. I remember big TV moment the NFL draft. If you get beyond the second round, and you look at the ratings between the first round and the second round. Th there's a huge, 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 huge drop off, and then you look at you know something where okay, XFL, USFL, those are typically like those are going to be drafting from low a lower point than the NFL draft all those rounds, and you can look at the numbers drop off. Is there really like is this something we should be allocating resources towards? In terms of making this a television moment. <clears throat> well, you're on Fox. So, mm -hmm. presumably Fox is going to want to give you the airtime and, and classify it as marketing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have it on the Coward sh Show. He loves to talk about it. I think it's something that, at this point, you, you got to you classify it as marketing. This is a big marketing push. Understand... We're not looking at NFL numbers here. We're look not look. It's going to be, it's not going to do huge numbers, but it's almost the clips from it. Mm -hmm. You're going to, the, we're going to see clips from draftees, right? You're going to see, uh, we're going to be able to, during the season, talk about they drafted this guy in the second round over this guy. They ended up getting picked later, five picks later. He's doing a lot better. Did the team make a mistake here? It's that kind of, it's the intrigue, the ability to use those clips on social media further into the season, the discussion talking points that people can have, the mock drafts. I mean, you the, think about how many mock drafts the NFL puts in. I'm not thinking that the USFL is going to have as many, but it gets people talking, gets people interested. It's just a, like, it's just a matter, I don't think you're looking at, we're going to make money off of the TV show that is this draft. I think we're just expanding our fan base creating yeah interest but it's all it's also like i th i think part of the thing is like they definitely have investors they definitely have people and and part of that pitch is that this is fox this is going to be television we got we know what we're doing with television and if the first sample from what you have is a draft that we're going to say, okay, this is not going to do, it's not going to have a huge draw, but it's going to, it's going to be promotion for anybody channel surfing. That's kind of more, a little bit more scary to the people that are putting the chips in, in the middle of the, of the table. Then we're going to have the, like the first thing that we're really putting money to is a football game. I understand that, mm. but I would hope that, that if you are big enough in Fox, you understand that, that it would be much scarier if once that football game starts and you realize very quickly that you have not done enough marketing and that the numbers are coming in a lot lower than you think. And there's a lot of, we could have done a lot more for the last six months to fix this issue because let's also be very clear. This is the spring link football does not have a good history and they, they are, they could make it to week five, be like, this isn't working, pull the plug. And, that is and and not and, out and of the at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, we're we're gonna have like we're gonna ha the USFL. I think has to still establish: is this about the players, or is this about you know the show? Is this about just the fact that hey, it's April, there's no football, where the football, you know, you, where, where else are you gonna go? You know, UFL, USFL, where the XFL was very like for all of the chaos to the XFLs, which was still very organized, but it was chaos. You know, it made it about the players and it made it about the players in a way that was like, we're going to do the interviews during the thing. But the, but the biggest thing was for the love of football, that slogan that just immediately got you invested in the, in, in the, the aims of the players who are doing this for the love of football. You know, that's appealing mm -hmm. And I, the USFL hasn't really done anything like that yet. And I think the USFL might be saying that this is more about the team names. This is more about, you know, the the kind of nostalgia of kind of the, the, the quaintness 
of our teams and in, in, to an extent um this is the about just the fact that nothing else is on and and they they might be trying to keep the players out of this which i think is is a route to go down but it's it's maybe not the route you know yeah it might not be the route to be successful mm -hmm. I, I i agree i and i think that's it's something that until they come out and tell us or really play their hand, it's not something that we're going to know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a very intriguing point that you bring up there. I, I agree. And that if the season starts, if we go into week one and we don't know the answer to that question, it's going to set up for failure because people are going to have to start making assumptions. People make assumptions. They're going to assume the worst. If you don't come right out and tell us how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's... I guess that's all she wrote on the the USFL draft. Sounds good. Yeah, and Let's then now the I mean, last topic. Yeah, finally the last topic. Not finally. We've we've been loving sharing this with you with you the viewer yeah, I today. I mean, you're, but... you're sewering me, being like you're supposed to start work. It is it is seven a.m. My official start work time is eight a.m. So if anybody from work is listening, I am not slacking off on my work from home. Well, day. well, you were the I one was that was like, "Oh, we gotta start at six. Yeah, we gotta, I, like, I gotta get cause, going." Because last night I said, "Chris, let's start at six o'clock. Are we, we sure we're gonna do that? Six o one's too late. Let me know." He go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, six o'clock. We'll be, we'll be ready. I'll be on. I'll be on." Go, okay, you never been on on time before in the mornings, and then. Yeah. 6 15 i'm going hey chris what, what what's going on here and you come on oh stayed up late last night. i'm here i'm here i'm on like, <laughs> me feel bad you were the one that was late hey, and, hey. Then, and then we came in with that tension and we had to just let it go so and it, might have been and a little it, tension and it in always the first time. you know you know you know what this is okay we're we got we got a good chemistry when there's a little bit of a, of a tension. When we when we like we immediately go from fighting to okay, we're recording and we have to pretend like we're friends for the camera. You know, yeah. I think there's a good tension there. Where there's a good back and forth. There's a good, you know, it warms us up. The argument warms us up for all of the sports conversations we're gonna have. All right. So and, I, and it allows I, us. So to, it, so really, cuts that, yeah, it cuts it down to where it's like if you make a point that I might not agree with, sometimes yeah. I'll be like I'll let it go. Now it's like you know what? I'm gonna yeah, argue. Yeah. Yeah. See. <laughs> see. So. So really, I mean, I do it on purpose. This is this is like a Mr. Miyagi kind of route that I take, and it leads to it always leads to a better show. Yeah. It's all about the content. Yeah. All because right. you know what happens if I don't get that five extra minutes of sleep? We're in a Bellator's in France situation, and nobody wants that. Yeah, that was that was something. That okay. Was, yeah. So I mean, now, if you really want to know about Bellator in France, just scroll down the YouTube, and you'll you'll find. Yeah, it click on Bellator's it. in France on our YouTube videos, and that and that will be understood in the first two minutes but yeah that was that was the first time we tried to do a morning episode and that did not work out well <laughs> no i'm shocked that we even tried again after that and it works out we well did, yeah we, we've done quite a few yeah yeah so, like probably CFL more often than not now especially yeah. with the cfl yeah. show yeah the weekly shows they really work out i think a lot better in the morning yeah uh, just to be able to get it out on time at night I yeah think. yeah and these CFL free agents talk about pending. They're waiting yeah. to even be talked about. <laughs> yes. So free agency officially opens for the CFL on February 8th. So we're probably going to be talking about this a few more times until then for free agents that don't re-sign with their teams. But as we have on the screen here, there's a few CFL listed their top 30 pending free agents. Let's go through some of the quick hits, talk about where they might land. Do you want me to bring up quick yeah, hits? Yeah, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. You, okay. You... Uh, but but this is where I'm just kind of like overwhelmed because we don't have this much time to talk about it. And no, I'm we're not through... talking about all thirty. Yeah, that's why Give I'm I'm scrolling through, through it. And I'm like okay, one through five. Yeah, one oh. through five. Okay. Uh, skip Claros. We already talked about Claros. He's resigned okay. with Winnipeg. He's so then four. one. Okay, one through five. So number five is going to be Stanley Bryant, O line, Winnipeg, Blue Bombers. Yeah, we, 
Yeah, he was the most outstanding mm -hmm. offensive lineman last year. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a theme with a lot of Winnipeg free agents. They got a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Is he going anywhere? I, I can't see him not staying in Winnipeg. You know what I mean? I think there's all nine teams would love to have him. Mm -hmm. The best fit, the most logical landing spot is back in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, why wouldn't you go back to Hamilton? You want you want two great cups with them. They're putting all their chips in for a third. I I think I think most of the, like why wouldn't you? You put yeah. yourself in those shoes, and it's like why wouldn't you? Well, somebody recently just resigned with Winnipeg, and I can't remember his name. I believe he was old lineman as well. And he was like, why why would I go somewhere for an extra ten grand and give up the shot to repeat? and continue to build what we've been doing yeah and i think that's going to be a lot of it is that what 20 years from now are you gonna be happy with that 10 grand that probably six to five after taxes yeah or are you gonna are you gonna want to be like i got a third ring on my finger and i got a lot of brothers that i continue to build something pretty special with yeah and and and, and also you got to factor in too i mean you look at probably 50 percent of the teams in the cfl Last season were just absolute chaos to work mm -hmm. under in terms of management, in terms of culture, in terms of all these things, right? Mm -hmm. Just pure, probably mental strain and chaos. You have a team in Winnipeg that has a solid feed under it, good coaching, mm -hmm. like the stress alone. You know, I, th I, I really think that most. Most people are because you you could even say I mean like a team like Hamilton that was in the Great Cup still had some some problems when it came to leadership you no, know I some agree. issues so so you like you really got to say okay we have something really special here in Winnipeg and I, and I think if you're kind of the one doling out checks you have a lot of freedom to to kind of get some get, get some deals on guys that you're resigning. And there's also an element too of if you're in Winnipeg, you're more likely to get a side deal in Winnipeg. Like a, a car dealership might call you up and say, "We're shooting a, a commercial for Winnipeg. Let's hire you into it." You think any team in the East cares? Like any any city in the East is not picking a CFL player to do a side deal with. They don't know that there's a CFL team in their city. So staying in Winnipeg, you might get a little less on your contract, but you're gonna make it up elsewhere. That's a complete. That's such a true fact, and I think that's true. I mean, to anybody in the West, that's that's one of the benefits to the Western teams is like there are other avenues to make money. I mean, in most like, if you're in say Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, um, or even like um, Alberta, you know, you you're you're gonna walk into a restaurant and it's gonna be comp. Like meals gonna be comp. They're gonna know immediately. Everyone's not gonna know who you are. It's gonna be comp. You're gonna be fine, you know. Whereas in the east, it's you can go a little bit incognito, a little bit more. You're just, yes. but yeah, I, I I think that Winnipeg's gonna have no problem now. Another guy in the Grey Cup, Mister Grey Cup himself. I mean, this is this is the good luck charm that's gonna that's gotten the last what like five five Grey Cup appearances. You know, Jagarit Davis. Does he friend end up back on the uh, yeah friend of the show? Does he end up back on the Hamilton Tiger Cats? I can't see a scenario where he's not. I and I'd love to Garrett. I would love him to come to Toronto. Mm -hmm. I see that mm -hmm. we're going to be talking to Garrett in the next few months, to asking him the question: What made you want to resign with Hamilton? Knowing damn well that the answer is going to be: I built a, an absolute family here. I love all my teammates. This place gives me a great opportunity to win. I'm happy here. I didn't want to leave. I I think that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think he has um, good good management around him. In like mm -hmm. in himself, I think he's going to get a good deal from Hamilton. He's well liked, well respected. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I think he's he's going to be in Hamilton. You're right. Now. Next, we got Jeremiah Mazzoli, who yeah. we've we the quarterbacks here we've touched on. Yeah, um, I I think that that's a real question. I think I think yeah, Ottawa 
or Edmonton might take a flyer. Or maybe Toronto, too. I think it, it depends on those teams. They need to figure out their own QB situation and then fall back to Masoli. All right. And then now number one is going to be Zach Kalaros, but number two is going to be Brian Burnham. Let's finish off talking. We've talked enough about Kalaros. Yeah. Let's yeah, finish, finish off the off. show talking about Byron Burnham. Yeah, he is. No matter who you talk to, he's in the top two wide receivers in this league. It's it's to me, it's mm-hmm. a, it's probably one A Geno Lewis, one B Brian Burnham. I think he's quite happy in BC. I think the depends on the QB situation there. Mm-hmm. I I would say, and a lot of people online agree with me with this that he's going to stay in BC. But if I'm Brian Burnham and I'm seeing a lot of QB potential turmoil if Michael Riley walks out mm-hmm. the door depending on what they plan to go with I might look elsewhere but I I think that right now he's happy with his family in BC and mm-hmm. it's uh it's best for him to probably stay there yeah I, I think I think so too and, and it's whether he's going to want to be looked on as kind of a security blanket for that BC offense that's going to be through a lot of uncertainty uh Michael Riley if he's playing his health is will will it always be there and also with Nathan Rorick is the experience enough to really you know he's going to get into trouble and when Nathan Rorick gets into trouble he's going to have to look at a guy that I know I can rely on I know I can throw to and that's going to be Burnham um that's a situation where some guys really get excited about and say you know I'm going to be I can really run this offense from the wide receiver slot or it can be, you know what, like I'm gonna be carrying all this weight and I'm not ultimately not gonna be able to do it. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna peak here. You know, I'm gonna be the peak. You sometimes you want like you wanna know if you're good, you want people around you, like maybe to not be the best guy on the team, because that means we got a pretty good shot, you know. And I think that's yeah. the the situation that Burnham I mean, you can look at it and and I could be a franchise guy here. I could be the face of this team next year amidst a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Or, you know, I could be also just tied down from my maximum potential from a team that's just not not in it next year. Yeah, it's uh, do you want to not waste, but do you want to spend some of your prime years on a team that might not make the playoffs? Or do you want to spend your prime years on a team that's going to be contending for a great cup? Mm -hmm. it's a question and familiarity and comfortability and his spot plays a lot into this decision if if he truly Mm -hmm. loves bc he might sit there and be like i want to help turn this franchise around lucky whitehead's on the field with me too i think we're probably make the top one two punch for wide receivers in the league Mm -hmm. i want to stay here i want to build it i want to give the bc fans that have given me a lot something Mm -hmm. to cheer about yeah and, and if it's about the money i think he has no problem getting uh that from bc i i think like no one i don't i a few people will outbid bc and i think ultimately it's going to be money chance to win those are the two things that are going to really be on the table uh for burnham i agree agree and that is the wrap-up of the show i think chris yes that is the wrap up of the show. We finally, it's over. It's finally over. All right. With that being said, thank you for tuning in. I am Brad. That is Chris. This is was our all football show. I don't think we're gonna go an hour every week on this. This was a uh, this is a marathon, but we are gonna be coming weekly with some of the USFL, CFL, XFL news. So stay tuned. Subscribe, like, and comment on this video. Uh, let us know in the comments if there's anything you'd like us to talk about or if you have any issues with what we've said. I'm sure a lot of you out there have some issues. And we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.